Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Social Flight Live. I'm Jeff Simon. We have such a cool and informative evening for you. We have Doug Evenick here from Tannis Aircraft, and uh, we are going to learn all about how to keep your aircraft cozy, the history of that company. Uh, it, it's just uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. He is a wonderful, wonderful guy. I'd like to start with a couple quick notes, of course. Um, first of all, there I, I have to encourage as many people as possible to get out there and check out all the different cool, fun fall events in Social Flight. Just go to socialflight.com and this free Social Flight mobile apps for Apple and Android devices. There are pumpkin drops happening. There's leaf foliage flights and all sorts of cool things happening as Ball starts to blanket the country. It's just, um, it's it's very cool to see what all the local chapters and clubs and organizations are doing. Uh, and it just, uh, it warms my heart because I'm all about supporting general aviation. That's why Social Flight exists. That's why this show exists. And if there's anything we can do to get more people flying and enjoying all of that, uh, the general aviation community has to offer. I am, I'm all in for it. So check out socialflight.com. Take a look at the map and you can see all of these cool things happening all over the place. We also have our fly to win challenge. We are giving away on November 1st, a Lightspeed Zulu 3 headset. All you need to do, have the mobile app, go fly, you check in on it at an airport. Even if you only do that once in the prize period, you are entered to win. And people who collect a bunch of points are in the leaderboard they get uh, an extra entry, and so that helps their chances to win as well. Now, uh, the other thing, of course, is we've released our Social Flight podcast, in case you're listening to that, and uh, that's a lot of fun on all the different podcast services, and we also have our FA learning system. And uh, if you go into Social Flight and you click on the Fast Team where it says FAA Credits in the menu, there are tons of videos in there that you can get wings credit just for watching. If you're a mechanic, you can participate in the Aviation Maintenance Technician Awards Program, the AMT program. And also if you're an IA, an AMP with inspection authorization, your eight hours of credit uh, for continuing education and your renewal are waiting for you for free in social flight. And you can just watch at your own leisure and it'll print off certificates for you. Next week, we'll be at NBAA, and uh, we're going to run kind of the usual thing. If you spot me down there, I may have a little swag for you from Social Flight. So feel free to reach out. And, and the last thing, as the temperatures do drop around here, is I'd like to thank tonight's sponsor of this program is Whip Air, who not only makes some of the most amazing floats, but they have a facility up there for maintenance, for aircraft sales, interiors, paint. I visited it, and uh, it is so, so cool there in South St. Paul, Minnesota. Be, be sure to go uh, check out Whip Air and thank them for making so much of this possible here on Social Flight. Now, I would like to uh, talk about tonight's guest. Uh, for many of us, fall is a time of amazingly beautiful leaf-peeping foliage flights, and along with, this, uh, with that, the temperatures, of course, begin to drop. As it gets colder and we bundle ourselves up for flying, we also need to think about how we are going to keep our aircraft warm for its own protection. Since 1974, Tannis Aircraft has been the number one household name in general aviation for engine preheating, and Doug Evenick has led its growth and expansion to become not just an aviation household name uh, within the U.S., but also a global brand in the world of preheating piston, turbine, and helicopters the world over. I absolutely love stories of business innovation, and especially in general aviation when it comes to things that can help anyone who's watching this become a more informed pilot, fly more even when it's snowy and crunchy underneath your feet, um, and uh, just do whatever we can to support general aviation. So with that, I'm going to bring Doug on with us, and please help me welcome to Social Flight Live, Doug Evink. How are you doing, Doug? Hey, Jeff. I'm doing well. Thank you. So thanks for taking time out to join us. We uh, we've connected a bunch of times, uh, and I just I just love your products, everything you do. And the last time that we bumped into each other was at Air Venture this year. Um, you had a really fun tent and booth going on. There was a lot of people there. 
but I managed to get some time out of you. And uh, well, it wasn't it great to see so much vibrance uh, in the community at, at, at what was, I think, the largest air venture ever? Yes, it truly was. I mean, we came out of 2020 with no air venture, got into 2021, and it was just so good to be back person to person. And uh, for us, it was an amazing 2021 because I think there was a pent up demand for purchasing. But uh, last year was just crazy. Uh, the number of people, uh, the number of events, because I'm sure Jeff, you were there two years ago. You know, we go there for so many reasons, but uh, one of the side benefits are the many, you know, many OEMs and vendors that have events in the evening. And those were just crazy good. Our uh, Hartzell Aviation Hops and Props was probably off the chart, uh, how many people we had there. Yeah, it is. Uh, it, uh, you know, for the, for those of you watching that have uh, been to Air Venture, it's it's fascinating to me because there's there's so many separate worlds to it. You have uh, you have kind of the world of the people who obviously who attend and get to see everything there. You get the world of the vendors and the companies and what it's like to to do that with setups and and events and things like that. You you have the tiny little community events for whatever your niche is. You have education, and as you just mentioned, for um, for those of us privileged enough to be in the industry and get to be able to snag an invite, there are some uh, there are some cool little events that go on put on. Uh, there's sometimes they're customer appreciation, and sometimes they're they're just kind of uh, for the company themselves. But there's a lot of fun stuff that happens during that week. Oh, there is, and then I even find myself you know, seeking out new ones, uh, you know, this year, you know, the home built had a little, just a cottage industry build up meeting in one of the uh, shelters. And yeah, it, it's a blast. Uh, of course, as a vendor, we, we look for it all year. And once we get in there, we love it. And then about two or three days into it, we, we remind ourselves it's a nine day slog. <laughs> so, so our crew at Tannis, we have lovingly called it Groundhog Day. You know, you, wake up in the same place, you see the same people, you do a couple little different things, but <clears throat> the next morning you wake up in the same place again and you start all over. <laughs> it's a it's a marathon of tw of of 20 of whatever sprints. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, it sure is. 26.2 sprints all put together. Yeah, it definitely is. So, uh, Doug, tell me a little bit about your background because one of the things I love about your story is you personally are kind of the steward of an iconic brand in general aviation and um, and you've really taken it to the next level what's what's your background how did you arrive at tanis yeah it's uh, it's a road right uh, that's uh, it's the road travel that gives you the the most uh, exciting adventures i i grew up in southwestern minnesota uh, on a farm on a, on a uh, livestock dairy and hog farm and uh, went into the corporate world pretty early in my career. I worked for the Maytag corporate office for several years and then was recruited to Johnson Controls. From that time, uh, recruited then outside of the corporate 500 to a mechanical contracting firm that I ran that uh, really specialized in uh, ammonia refrigeration, uh, energy payback projects, uh, really fit into my, my desire of of literally making sure that you let science and engineering prove your story. Uh, along with that, we also had a calibration firm. If you think about that, medical devices in Minnesota were just springing off the, off the chart and they were building clean rooms and we got into that. We started a um, medical device calibration on-site format. And uh, I led that company to a good growth part where we then sold it in uh, late, I think, 2008 timeframe. And I uh, was with the new company for three, four years. And ironically, at that same time, my uh, daughter was, our daughter was in high school and she ran track with, uh, uh, with a large people, a large group of people. Of course, if you are a father or a mother and you go to track meets, uh, Jeff and I were talking about that. They're they're a lot, much longer than a football game. They're much longer <laughs> than a soccer game. The only You're thing we talk about is time, whether it's track or swim or any of that stuff. Yeah. You know, and and if they start with a preliminary event, uh, it's at the beginning of the meet, and then run the four by four at the end of the meet. Uh, you're there for a good 
good chunk of the day. Uh, while doing that, uh, I met up with a gentleman who at that particular time was buying a company called Tannis Aircraft Products. And uh, his son had ran similar events to my daughter. And uh, you know, we, we had plenty of time to bond with each other. And I remember him telling me, uh, and when I asked him, I said, well, what, what, what do you mean plug it in? And air-cooled engines, you know, the last air-cooled engine I had dealt with at that time was on a Continental motor on, uh, on a swatter that was on a, <laughs> on a farm equipment. You know, everything was water cooled otherwise. So yeah, air cooled engines. And he said, well, we plug them in just like you do your truck and other things. And I'm like, okay, uh, that's an industry. And we learned uh, through that period of time, a uh, unique side story to that. Uh, that gentleman's son and, and my daughter ended up being prom dates <laughs> for one of the <laughs> high school proms. Uh, but uh, ratcheted forward, uh, that was Bob Kruger and uh, Bob had heard that I sold the company, obviously, and uh, had uh, some period of time that I was with it. And he was getting at that point where he was looking at a transition. I had worked with a lot of Fortune 500 companies, brought our company uh, services into the you know the big the big corporations in Minnesota like 3M and Medtronic and uh, GE and things like that. And he felt that that was a good fit for Tannis moving forward. And I remember him calling me up and I said, no, nah, I'm not interested. And then about, uh, I think it was less than eight weeks later, um, I ended up uh, being interested in, in purchasing the company back in 2012. Wow. Now you, you, I don't want to let slip by that back when you were saying that you were with Fortune 500 companies here, you, I, I know that when we were talking, you, you mentioned being on an aircraft with the Maytag repairman, yeah, like yeah, the, so. the real guy. Right. You know, it was, uh, you know, it was very fortunate, uh, you know, where at that particular time, uh, Jesse White, and then I was there during the, uh, the lineage change from Jesse White to Gordon Jump. And I actually have sitting in my other office in, in the Twin Cities where I'm, I'm at our manufacturing plant in Glenwood, Minnesota right now, West Central Minnesota. I have a picture with Gordon Jump uh, over in uh, Newton, Iowa, where Maytag was built. And uh, yeah, it was uh, an interesting run because you jump in at that time with Saberliner and Learjets. Really interestingly, we had two female pilots. Now this was in, uh, if you think of the time frame, this is 1980s. Uh, and early 90s, and that was uh, quite unique for that's corporate awesome. pilots. We had many corporate pilots, but uh, that's one of the neat side stories. And the other side story I think I told you is, uh, you know, Tannis Aircraft Products, the history there. Uh, Pete Tannis started it in the 70s, as you let off with. And, you know, really, he, he was in northwestern Iowa at the time, flew freight for a packing, a uh, livestock packing firm, in Sioux Falls and had all the issues about dealing with cold weather in the Midwest and designed and patented the very first uh, preheat system in the early 70s. Uh, and then went from that period of time, moved up to Glenwood, Minnesota, uh, where it's been since uh, the 80s uh, and currently resides. Uh, but he passed away at a pretty early age and uh, I think it was year 2000. Uh, the family then sold it to another gentleman who uh, was from the Twin Cities, a marketing director, and unfortunately he uh, landed short of the runway after an ice-up condition. Uh, so his family had to sell it, and that's when Bob Kruger, the gentleman that I told you about, had uh, had purchased it, and we had known each other. And I kidded with you earlier when I when we talked. I'm the only person that's bought it from a live person. You know, and, oh, God. <laughs> And I don't know if that's something good to talk about. Now, of course, Joe and Jim Brown have purchased it uh, and been keeping the history going. Uh, I sold Tannis Aircraft Products to Arsenal Aviation back in June 30th of 2021 uh, to take it to the next, uh, you know, really uh, a company that's been around since uh, Orville and Wilbur Wright. Uh, a lot of history there. So it was it was a pleasure uh, doing it, but uh, so now there's two of us. But I'm the only, I'm the first one to negotiate with a live person, so I've, I've got that up on Jim and Joel. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> well, um, putting a, uh, a a more living spin on things, let's <laughs> let tell me a little bit about the the basics. You know, most most folks, at least, kind of in our world, are are starting at the piston side. Correct. And um, 
there there's a lot to know about this because it's uh, you want to you want people to fly during the winter. You want them to fly when the temps when the temps drop. It's healthy for the aircraft. It's good for the person for their own skill set and to stay current and and proficient, which is more important than current. And um, and at the same time, there's a lot of um, a lot of wear and a lot of damage that can occur to an aircraft, and especially an aircraft engine, if it's really cold out. And you live in a cold place, my friend, um, <laughs> in the winter. So uh, uh, tell me some of the basics that, yeah. that what people need to know. And uh, I, I, I can all, I tend to look back at history once in a while and try to put myself in someone else's shoes, like Pete Tannis, where he uh, really started it and, and knew uh, that there was a lot of harm done to an engine if you could start it. But of course, the first part where it was like, we want to be able to start it. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe at some particular temperatures, having that engine start is the worst thing we can do to it because the basic start, so let's talk about air-cooled piston engines where most of us in the general aviation side are flying, or at least you know, you're starting your, you know, your very first flight, you know, your discovery flight, and then as you take your right. flying lessons in a small piston air-cooled engine, whether it be 172 or 150. Right. Because the first time people come across this, right, they're they're used to getting in starting their car no matter what. Uh, at least at least for those of us who who don't get into the minus digits. But, right. But well, yeah. and then you know, as I'm as I'm balding here and, and your hair is getting blacker and blacker every day, right, Jeff? <laughs> you know, some of us older folks remember plugging our cars in in order to make them start. While technology with uh, fuel injected engines and the lower compression and all of the technology that exists, people don't even know what it is to be concerned about starting a car when it's minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit or even zero uh, out. Well, that transcends into the whole world of, you know, here you are, you're so excited, you're flying for the very first time. And as you mentioned, flying in the fall and the winter is some of the best time because it's a lot smoother. You know, granted, where we're at, you know, the, we get this sunrise, sunset getting too close together. But, you know, you, you probably have more mission capability time in that period of time because the weather isn't. You're not going to have a thunderstorm brew up. I mean, yesterday or two days ago, it was 50 degrees for a high here in Glenwood, and today it was 82. Tomorrow, I think, it's again, the high is going to be 50. Well, you know, that, that air is what you're riding on. So, you know, a pilot all of a sudden says, now it's cold, um, you know, and they're telling me there's a cold start procedure. What does that really mean? And uh, getting into a little bit of the basics that Pete designed and when I purchased the company, the team that I had together, some great employees and great people that had worked there here in the past had pulled all of this information. But with myself and the calibration firm we had, we were able to take and start capturing some of this data to prove to folks there's really three basic parts. That that piston that slides up and down is uh, a different material than the cylinder wall, than the air-cooled fins on the side of the cylinder, and the oil and the crankshaft, and they all expand at different rates when they're heated up. So when it's cold out, when it uh, and most engine manufacturers mandate, if you look at their POH, they mandate preheating at minus or excuse me, at 20 degrees Fahrenheit, I was gonna get into the C side, but uh, at 20 degrees Fahrenheit, they need to see it preheated because when you start the engine, that heat expands at different rate. We don't have good oil flow right away. We have oil pressure, but not good oil flow. And you hear the term making metal. So one, you need to heat up those cylinders prior to starting so you don't have that metal to metal issue of really wearing down your aircraft engine. Now, our dear friend and your uh, person that's been a panelist many times, Mike Bush, has made statements uh, like 200 hours to TBO if you do a cold start. It's a great advertisement for us. We don't have any data to prove that right now, <laughs> but it, it's very concerning You know that, that each cylinder needs to be heated. Secondly, and we always think that well, hey, we can just throw heat on that oil sump, you know, because we need the oil's thick. Uh, now that we've got multi-viscosity, it's not as thick, but 
there's still some of true blue people that like to run straight weight oil. If I just heat that oil up, won't that heat everything else up in the engine? Well, yeah, if you heat the oil up, one, it takes a lot of heat. You have to determine how are you applying that heat. If it's a great big pad, you could be coking the oil, you could be getting the oil too hot. And here's the big part that Tannis has put out in the industry to try to get everyone to understand. There is moisture sitting in and on and below our oil after we're done flying every time because just the blow by from the combustion process has vapor that uh, if you took a relative humidity instrument and put it into your crankcase, it's gonna be near 98 to 100% relative humidity at 180, 160 degrees, whatever it is. That all condenses, sits on the oil, then eventually goes down to the bottom of the oil. Well, now you flip it around, that's gonna to start to evaporate. It's evaporating when we're not flying, but that preheating process will increase the rate of evaporation. It's the delta between, getting into the physics side, between the dew point inside your crankcase, not the dew point sitting at ATIS uh, or at the airport, the dew point inside your crankcase versus the temperature of the oil, the greater that delta, which obviously happens when we heat the sump, the more that vapor is going to evaporate and that evaporate, evaporation effect goes up, hot air rises, and up above our oil line are some pretty critical parts of our aircraft engine. And they're colder than the oil if you have a, a sump only preheat system. And then they just find the cam lobe or the cam or the valve or the side of the cylinder wall and it'll condense on there. And if you're flying right after you preheat, no big deal. You know, you blow that, you get oil through there or you get that moisture out. But what happens if uh, you get fogged in or what happens if all of a sudden something changes and you don't fly? And you do that over and over and over again. That causes a huge issue. And that's why TAS's multi-point preheat system where we basically take a threaded element into each cylinder uh, now, we used to use the CHT wells because they were all open back in the days of Pete Tannis because there wasn't such a thing as an engine monitor. But now we use the rocker cover or an intake tube, put a threaded element into each cylinder, and then we take a pad element and put that on the bottom of the sump. Uh, and on a six cylinder system, one on the bottom of the sump and one on top of the case. But what we are designing is everything above the oil line in that air cooled piston engine is going to be warmer than the oil. So even if that moisture evaporates up out of the oil, there's no place for it to condense. A lot of physics is that moisture cannot condense on something that's warmer mm -hmm. or above the dew point. So that, that's the key. That's the, the second part. And then you know, the third part of preheating, you know, we we talking about an engine, and uh, you know, that that's obviously the the lifeblood and the heart of that aircraft, but there are many other things, the battery. Uh, what happens if you frost a spark plug? If you've ever had that experience, you know that's a no-flight condition because you're taking the spark plugs out and getting them to thaw out. So now we have developed that third step of not only looking at just the engine, but we're looking at the whole critical driveline component, uh, prop reduction gearboxes, batteries. A lot of our batteries are now located aft of the firewall, so they don't get the benefit of the heat that we're creating inside of the engine. So that, that's our, uh, our four minute elevator speech on really what's critical about preheating. And what makes Tannis' system so unique is, you know, we can leave that system on all the time because everything above the oil line is warmer than the oil. Mm -hmm. Others, you cannot do that or you should not do that because they will start depositing oil or just moisture on different places. What about, what are your, your views on things like uh, engine blankets also in addition to a system like yeah. that? Yeah, so, you know, we, if you, if our customers look at the data we have, we, we publish, here's how warm we will get the cylinders and the oil above ambient because the law of physics is the amount of heat we put into an object, it's always above ambient. Well, our cylinders on a four and six cylinder piston air cool engine, we'll get them 50 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit above ambient. Well, if ambient is 20 degrees in Boston, where you're at, or 10 degrees, that's great. You really don't need much more than that if you're in uh, unheated hangar, so you don't have any air blowing through your cowl. But let's say you are in Minnesota, or for a lot of our friends up in Canada and Alaska, it's below zero. Well, 50 degrees above ambient, I'd like to see that warmer. That's the use of 
the insulated engine covers or definitely cowl plugs. We have a, uh, when, you know, when we're doing presentations for IA seminars, I do a ton of those where we show a flight school that we work with where they would tuck the aircraft into the uh, very big hangar at the end of the day. But until the end of the day, that hangar door stayed open. And so we data logged one of the aircraft that was in, tucked back in the corner. And we started it at probably six o'clock and about eight o'clock that night, the hangar door went shut. And all of a sudden we saw the temperatures of the cylinders jump up about five to 10 degrees. Just the airflow, mm -hmm. just normal convection of, of, it wasn't that windy of a day, but the air moving in and out of your cowl, those air cooled fins do just a marvelous job of cooling off that engine. So that gets to the point of when and why you should use at least cowl plugs, uh, or of course an insulated engine cover, cover up that cowl opening. opening. Uh, that helps you when you need, uh, really, you know, we, we stay anytime you're starting to see single digit or below uh, Fahrenheit numbers, you will need to have that horse blanket or cowl yeah. or insulated cowl, cowl cover to give you that additional rise above ambient. Yeah, and and I may be more you know conservative than some, but what I what I tend to always do both for myself and recommend for others as a as a mechanic and an IA is um, is always to go that that cover route because I'm thinking even not just about the engine, but I'm thinking about uh, uh, well the core part of the engine I should say the major you know core components, but I'm thinking everything as you work work your way out from that. I know with Continental engines, for example. Uh, your starter adapter and your starter is pretty far away, and that's got oil flow to it. And and so we want to um, do whatever possible to keep condensation from starting to happen in there. Or even things like you know, in my plane is a piece of plastic, you know, that that covers the 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 vacuum in it, you know, uh, system in intake, which those things crack and of course you know cost the price of a small car. And you know, why not insulate? everything and let it pretend it's uh you know bermuda in there yeah. when you need it yeah there's and people always will ask us well is there a harm you know if, if it's 40 degrees in my hangar and i have your preheat system and an engine blanket on and i leave it on all the time again we've done this has been our model uh for, for the last 10 years we give you data so you can make decisions especially if you have an engine monitor now you're getting a lot of that data the minute you snap the masters on uh, mm -hmm. See, hey, it's 40 degrees out. Uh, I got the 60 degree rise from the Tannis preheat system or a 50 degree rise, so it's 90. Now I got the insulated engine cover, so it's a 120 degree cylinder, 160 degree cylinder. Well, guess what temperature they're running at when they're running, you know? Mm -hmm. So you're not going to cause an issue unless you happen to be in, you know, a 100 degree area and you leave your insulated engine cover and your Tannis on, then, you know, we, we don't ever like to see the oil, the sump oil, being heated by some means of external, either conduction or even uh, air force. We don't like seeing that oil up above uh, 140 degrees. Mm -hmm. uh, 120 degrees is our sweet spot uh, from heating it up because if you think about that, this little pad, I've got some of them here, I mean, that's all the bigger that pad is, you know. So that's going to be a lot warmer than 120 degrees in order to get my oil to 120 degrees. I don't want that to cause any problem with the oil that's sitting right next to that pad on the bottom of the sump. That makes sense. The other thing that comes to mind to talk about is, is you know, let's go back to corrosion for a minute, because the other thing that comes to mind is, uh, you know, I've spent a lot of time with, uh, I use CamGuard, for example, look a lot at, at, at what, what we can do to reduce corrosion, which does so much damage as an influencer on, on engines. And I think one of the things that, that has been pointed out to me in the past has been in general, the, what an impact it is that you talk about charts and there are charts about the rate of corrosion simply based on temperature. And what I, what I tend to think about for myself and correct me if I'm wrong on this, it isn't so much about the idea of kind of preheating or not preheating or how you're doing. It. It's that basic idea that if you're, most people who are in those colder climates are flying a lot less during that time, even if they want to. And 
so if you're going to leave something to sit, you're almost preserving it better by having it sit alone for two weeks between flights or more at a, at a lower temperature than leaving it there at that cowl all set up at 70 degrees and left so, for for weeks. Yeah, that's a great question. We get that asked so many times. Uh, what what happens because in Minnesota and other places in the in the northern part of the Midwest, we have what we call a lot of the snowbirds that tend to fly to uh, Arizona and Florida and stay there for several months. Uh, so first thing in that, if you're not flying your aircraft for months, we have a preservation kit and every engine manufacturer talks about how to preserve that engine by using the mineral oil, the NOx rust and desiccant and such. So we'll set that one aside. The second one, as you were just describing, you know, I would rather have, you know, you're saying, putting my, trying to put myself, you know, restating what you just stated, you know, I'd rather have my engine colder when I'm not flying than hotter when I'm not flying. And in general, if you think about the location where that happens to be, if that was happening, uh, usually it's in a warmer, more humid climate. Mm. So we've done many tests. Uh, we, we, we have uh, data loggers that obviously do temperature, but also do dew point and humidity. And we have found that we can start plugging in our preheat system in October, November, and we leave it plugged in until March, April, May, because we've got a huge delta between the temperature of the engine and the dew point of that crankcase or the area in between. So we know no moisture can condense on it. That, that's really the key that we found in our tests is what you were stating about earlier. If I have some moisture that condenses on a piece of metal, if it's 20 degrees below zero or it's 100 degrees, it's gonna corrode more at 100 degrees. There's no doubt about that exponentially more. Mm -hmm. But if I can keep that moisture from condensing on there, or in your case, and you know, Aeroshell and all the other folks are putting additives in their oil so that that oil stays on that component for a longer period of time in between that, that really helps uh, the corrosion. But you'll hear people from Tannis and uh, our, our product development manager who has been with Tannis two different stints, but for several decades, uh, he, he always tells folks that, you know, you're worried about corro corrosion, find a young kid that wants to build hours and fly your plane when he's not flying. <laughs> that's <laughs> so true. The best thing you can do is get that plane up, fly it, get it to temp, and don't wait around to do it again the next time. Well, that, that's so true, right? I mean, uh, and, and, and as you pointed out, you know, your system isn't going to, is, is the beauty of it, is it's not, you're not going to get condensation that's going to cause that that so condensation isn't the issue but right. at the same time we're all fighting even if you take that out of the equation you've got oil that's laden with acids that are the combustion byproducts and things like that sitting on your cam and crank and everything else and you just don't want that to sit so you know get someone to fly your plane <laughs> get out there yourself and and, and do more flying and uh, maybe at very least then um, use uh, what are your uh, systems, the desiccant systems, and everything yeah. to keep it um, to keep the moisture level down altogether, uh, or at least as much as possible, and then heat it all up as a whole with one of your systems when it's time to fly. Yeah, and, you know, we and we even though you know we, we rely on selling our system for the livelihood of our business, but we want people to fly. I mean, you'll see us. Uh, obviously, we're a Minnesota company, and I don't know if you just picked that out, our dear friends in South St. Paul, another Minnesota company, and very, very good friends of Tannis, uh, both Minnesota companies. We encourage people with various events to get out and fly all the time. Uh, we have a, a, a group of people in central Minnesota that started an ice port. So when all the ice houses, which those that are listening now are sitting over there going, ice houses? Let me see, what's that? Yeah, we actually move things that you can live on on top of the ice because the ice is thick enough to move a house over top of it. Uh, we, we we do that on a regular basis, and in Minnesota, at the end of February, those houses have to be off the lake for DNR reasons and ice condition reasons. But on Lake Mille Lacs, a bunch of folks got together and they they said, "Well, hey, we got we always blow this great big plow, this great big road to take all these ice houses off the lake. 
they're out on the last weekend in February. How about the first weekend in March? We have a, a great big airport uh, here on the ice, and we called it Iceport. And we started that uh, now going on uh, almost 10 years ago with uh, about 30, you know, maybe maybe 20, 30 planes at the first event. Uh, and then of course, we spiced it up by giving away a little swag and such. And we've had as much as 160 airplanes land on the ice just for the fun of getting out and flying. And that, that leads to my point being as much, I mean, as, as much and as much time as people talk about corrosion and talk about all the additives and stuff that they could do, if they would go out flying more often, that would be something of the past. Yeah. That makes it makes a lot of sense. We we have one here, Alton Bay Ice Runway, that you always wait yeah, for. That's for a that. huge one. Well, that's actually that's actually a named airport. Yeah. Yes, it is on the chart. It's on the charts. Yeah. Alton Bay, that you hope it you hope it opens every year, and and uh, it's it's definitely a lot of fun. Now you, the other thing, which you guys have come out with recently, and is very near and dear to my heart, is a cabin heater. Um, I I remember years ago. <laughs> flying out to, um, I believe it was Oshkosh for a meeting with EAA in the, um, I think it was a balmy day to them, and it was, for me, probably the, the coldest temperature I'd ever seen. It was about five below or something like that. Um, and I just remembered that going to get back into my plane the next day or something like that, it was one thing. I had taken care of the engine. I'd plugged that in. But... I went to do something like to move the, it was a grumman at the time, move the canopy and my hand went right through the plastic like it was paper. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so you think about avionics, you think about gyros, you think about plastic and leather and everything else that's inside your plane. There's a value to trying to heat everything. Yes. There surely is. And that there's a great story behind that because uh, I can't take any credit other than, uh, we we just pushed it through and actually got a certified aircraft or cabin avionics heater now, but you know the the items that are so stinking expensive. Other than you know let's let's move away from the engine now we're after the firewall. That avionics bay is a pretty expensive part of the airplane, and hearing that gyro squeal, uh, which we get to hear <laughs> on a regular basis when it's below zero, is pretty frightening. And the folks before here, I mean, you'll still see our, our biggest competitor is people like, well, why, why do we buy yours when we can go out to the big box retailer or even our local hardware store, buy a nice little quote that they call ceramic heater and, and plug that in. And that works real great until you tell your insurance agent that, or if you look into some logs, you will see where a, a coat fell off the seat because they moved the hang, the the airplane a little bit and got over top of that heater and didn't have the protection to turn it off. And all of a sudden we have a melting of the interior of the cockpit. So we had a cabin heater that we had made uh, as a portable, but our desire and Dirk Ellis, our product uh, development manager was really a champion of this. And a couple of our previous owners, they wanted to have something that we could mount in there permanently. Also use it, as a portable, but we we worked and worked. At first, we were we were a little stunned because there really wasn't any means of certification because a cabin heater. Okay, so you're used in flight. No, this is used prior to flight. Yeah, um, yeah the FAA absolutely okay. loves it when you come to them with a product they've never, certi yeah, never yeah, certified. Yeah, they want to see a cert basis. So, uh, truth be told, and of course nobody's listening to this, so nobody will ever hear anything, right, Jeff? Uh, <laughs> The reason it's called an avionics slash cabin heater is we found a cert basis on the avionics side, <laughs> nice. not, not on the cabin heater side. So we found a great positive temperature coefficient. That's that's the term, technical term for ceramic. And what that really means is if I, if I take this piece of tissue and I stick it into the element, I'm not going to do a thing. It can't even ignite that. It'll never get anywhere near ignition temperature. And that's number one to start with. And yes, the big box and the hardware store have those too, but they don't have all the other safety devices right. that go into it. So we... What does uh, ceramic mean? What, is it, what does that mean? Well, that's, so, you know, if you look at a positive temperature coefficient element, if you look at it, it looks like ceramic because it is made of 
a ceramic type of cover. So there's ceramic that goes over top of it. So it's a chemical compound that's laid up against metal. And what happens is positive temperature coefficient. So the greater the delta between the air going in uh, versus that element, the more heat it puts out. Uh, the warmer it gets, so the closer they're together, it puts out less heat. And the sweet spot that we wanted to be into was we wanted to be able to mount that cabin avionics heater permanently inside the aircraft, run the wiring through the firewall into our plug that we have uh, that's hopefully located someplace area securely, that once you plug it in, you now have engine preheat and you have cabin avionics preheat and you can forget about it. And the 500 watts was a key, that's the size of it, because that gave us the ability to have that along with our six cylinder uh, STC preheat system draws 460 watts. You marry those together, they're a little under a thousand watts. You can run it uh, for overnight with a 2000 watt generator and not have an issue. So we want it, and probably more so, forget about the generator side, going into your wall outlet and your hangar, that's going to be a 15 amp, maybe if you're lucky, a 20 amp outlet. And if you have more than 500 watts, because a, a motor always starts with an inrush that draws more amperage, so that 500 watts, which is basically five amps, when it starts, it jumps up to 10 and then goes down to five. Well, if you plug those two together, 10 on the heater on the cabin and five on your engine, now you're snapping your 15 amp breaker. Mm. We come out with that device in 2016, I think it's 2016, and uh, it has been a dream. Uh, one, a very, very, very good customer of ours uh, puts it in almost all their aircraft along with our preheat system on the engine. And Mike, they, Mike, am I going to out who that is? Uh, uh, the, uh, I'll, I'll tell you this part right here, Jeff. It may, may be a hint. It has a, a, some aluminum crush in their seat portion of the aircraft uh, when the aircraft is no longer flying and uses a parachute to land. <laughs> uh, it, but you know, we laugh about that, but one of the things is if it's 20 below zero, guess what temperature that wonderful crush seat is down below your foam? It's 20 below zero. Well, when we warmed up the cockpit and uh, actually my product development manager and myself were down at another engine manufacturer or another airplane manufacturer's site with a full glass cockpit and you're trying to sit over there and say, I can't see my instruments. I can't start, I can't start the end. I can start the engine, but I still can't see it because it's so cold. We warmed up the avionics, warmed up the creature comfort. And oh, by the way, that 20 below seat, 20 below Fahrenheit seat is now above zero. And when you sit on it, uh, it doesn't feel like you're sitting on a block of ice for a period of time. Uh, and that, that, that has, uh, been in a marvelous uh, success for us. And flip side of it, we always measure our product on how well it lasts and, you know, making sure that it's the best of the best that's out there. And we've sold thousands of those and we have not had a warranty return other than the plug that people uh, plug it in and out of because we still sell it. It can be done as a portable or as a permanently mounted device. And we had an EMS helicopter operation where they're plugging it in, plugging it out after every op. And that inside of the uh, cabin heater, avionics heater, it had a failure of the actual wire. But uh, out of thousands of units, we've yet to have our first failure of fan motor, which is a, a DC synchronous low voltage fan motor and a PTC element that's uh, the best of the best. Wow. That's that's great, and it doesn't hurt, of course, for your uh, the fact that your uh, OEM and your OEM uh, uh, folks that are that are out there are, are if they're not in Wichita, we know that they're in Duluth or uh, New London, Ontario. Um, these are not, you know, they're they're not coming out of Sarasota, Florida, or something. No. Some of them might be at Vero Beach. Cool temperatures. Yeah, some of them come out of Vero Beach, but uh, you know, uh, yeah, we're we're fortunate to have many folks uh, have their manufacturing site there, or we do a ton overseas. So uh, again, the gentleman I was mentioning about, Dirk Alice, actually went and visited our customer in Austria and, uh, and in Germany and places like that. And you know, the great thing about that is their temperatures seem to be pretty darn close to ours. So it's mm -hmm. a single quieter. 
I, I was also surprised to learn that this isn't just a piston thing, that, you know, we think about hopping into, a, you know, a commercial airliner and they just spool up, it seems, no matter what. Um, you also do quite a bit of turbine business. Tell me what needs to be warmed up on those folks. Yeah, that's uh, actually, that is the largest segment of our business. Uh, our turbine segment of our business, that being fixed wing and rotor wing, is uh, actually two times larger than our piston side of our business. Now, truth be told, again, again, nobody's listening, right, Jeff, so I can state this. It's a little bit more expensive for the turbine side of the business. So. <laughs> you think? Is it, is it, is it, I think that's pretty much true of everything with those guys. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but the good thing is they last longer. So, uh, yeah, you know, the, the question came out, and, and again, Pete Tannis did this a long time ago, but we really started taking it to the next level. And when we said critical driveline components, uh, several of the turbine the manufacturers will say, well, our turbine will start at minus 40. And then when you get to talk inside of the factory and you ask an engineer that says, well, we ask them, what temperature would you like to start at? Oh, 60 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't want to start at minus 40. That's, that's terrible. But it can and it will. Uh, but again, we had to remember the turbine is not the only part there. Obviously, it's driving things. So prop reduction gearbox. You know, we've we've got on the rotor wing side, you know, main rotor gearboxes, tail rotor gearboxes, mod motors, fuel control units, fuel pumps, uh, you know, all of those items that are affixed to that turbine are critical driveline components that have lubricant inside of them that are very susceptible to cold temperature. Now, again, we don't have that dissimilar metal thing going on. We just have something that's so cold that it's hard to turn or it's not ideal to turn. Mm -hmm. uh, and a uh, case in point, we had one customer that said, you know, yeah, we we take a, a blast, we call it a blast furnace, or you know, Herman Nielsen, that blow a lot of heat in there, and that makes us feel good, but it really doesn't make the engine feel that good, because it takes so long to get inside of it, and then they started it up, it, it fired, and they went to take the prop out of uh, beta and roll the prop seal, mm -hmm. and, you know, that that is for them, you know, that's mission critical because one one lost op for them is a lot of money. And oh, by the way, we're talking tens of thousands of dollars to replace that prop seal. So we do we do a ton in that uh, side of the world. Uh, and then when you take turbine into the EMS law enforcement search and rescue, you know, the Coast Guard type, it's all about how quick can we get up in the air. Right. And uh, we had a customer uh, come to us at one of our trade shows, Heli Expo, that said, hey, ever since we've installed your system, we now can go from off the lift off in two minutes. Uh, they're an EMS operator out in the northwest part of the United States. It's all about mission critical yeah. capability. So now you're seeing us talk about preconditioning an aircraft versus preheating an engine. And, and I didn't even realize that the on especially on things like helicopters that even if it's warm out they can't just take off they they need all these components to be up to a certain temperature even if it's 50 degrees out yeah. they need everything to get out to a certain temperature before they can lift off and go rescue someone right so you know there are uh, various uh, different operating parameters based on the aircraft and the uh, the company but many of them have minimum main rotor gearbox requirements, just like we have uh, prop reduction gearbox requirements. Uh, we need to see a certain temperature in that prop reduction gearbox before we can take off, because if that oil isn't up to temp, the gears that are driving inside of there are having more difficult time, and that can set up a harmonics issue that has torque oscillations in place, hmm. which of course, when you got that little funny spinny thing you know you talk about the folks in wichita we have the fun of visiting folks in wichita and piney flats and mirabelle and one of them has things that stick out of the airplane that they call wings <laughs> and another one has a thing that spins around on the top of the air the craft that they call wings and one says i don't know why you'd want to be so bored and sit there and fly something with these things that just stick out straight and level flight and then the other people say why in the heck would you fly something without wings <laughs> so uh, as you know, the aviation industry is just a great group of people and so much fun to deal with. But yeah, there's a seriousness to it when you're looking at an EMS 
uh, operation that needs to lift and find someone in uh, you know in a mountain someplace or maybe a traffic accident and they need to get from A to B to save someone's life. That difference between you know off to lift off in two minutes or off to lift off yeah. in 15 minutes, it could be life or death. That makes that 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 has a big impact when you think about something like that. Yeah. Um, you managed as a company to do something that I, I find amazing, uh, which is that during COVID, during the, the worst of times, and and also even through supply chain, you you certified, you 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 created you got a new STC out there. I think it's yeah. on this guy, unless I'm gonna find out real quick that I pulled uh, the that I pulled the wrong the wrong aircraft. But um yeah, it's close. That's it. Pretty it's sure. The same, the same <laughs> airframe. It's just not the same aircraft, but you're right. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, I think I shared with you, Jeff. Uh, you know, the the how, Super Puma. Is that yeah, right? how the world changes once you have something that happens in your lifetime called uh, a pandemic. And uh, we go to numerous trade shows, but a couple of our biggest are obviously Air Venture. Second biggest for Tannis is Heli Expo. And in uh, January of 2020, it was uh, held in Anaheim, California. And uh, I always go out there a little early because we have a nonprofit uh, golfing outing that helps for scholarships for people going into the aviation industry. Uh, and just before going out there, I remember talking as we prepared, as uh, to our team went over there, we talked a little bit about this thing called COVID that was happening in uh, China, because we had meetings set up. I think I had over a half a dozen meetings set up with Chinese individuals that are going to hopefully be there. We didn't think a lot about it, but if you recall, January of 2020 was a pretty uh, infamous time for a helicopter. Just before the show started on that Sunday when we were golfing, uh, I saw several of my friends leave the golf course uh, because that was when uh, Kobe, the, air, the helicopter carrying Kobe Bryant and his children and other people uh, landed uh, and crashed probably 20 miles away from where we were golfing. And that was just the start of the trade show. Well, then trade show starts and it was kind of a lull and we get back to the office and within four, five, six weeks, we have some of our biggest customers shutting down. Uh, and then pretty soon, almost all of our biggest customers shutting down. And we just uh, really said, hey, we got to, you know, uh, being a, from Minnesota and hockey is one of our favorite things. You still keep the stick on the ice and keep on skating. Uh, we had we had STCs in the hopper. We had a customer that was moving, that was installing a high voltage power line across Canada. And they needed that Super Puma, which they used to pick up the basically the high voltage power line poles, because there's no roads, and, and put them in various places across the continent, across the country, and uh, they were having so much time, so a hard time doing it. And, and we talked to them at Heli Expo in Anaheim, we're saying, boy, I don't know how we're gonna be able to do this with COVID. And uh, our product development manager and the rest of our team slugged it out and, uh, you know, we uh, don't know, and I don't know that there's data in there, but we worked with our ACO and the FAA saying, here's what it is, what we have to do. And they're saying, well, can you even get into Canada? And uh, I think we, we probably had a letter go across the prime minister's desk almost to get it there, but we got it there. And we did uh, the whole certification and uh, did the installation qualification test via Zoom, that word that we've all, we didn't even know what that meant other than a hot sports car, right? Uh, that you and Zoom, Zoom in in the past. Uh, we did it via uh, a cell phone, watching it, a camera uh, in a couple different locations. And we had our uh, ACO and their folks from our MITO and our, uh, our product development manager there on site. And we literally got the installation qualification done on that Super Puma that uh, now we've since uh, have the STC and it's on several of their aircraft up there. Wow, that is very, uh, I mean, very cool that you managed to make it through all that and yeah. and and that you survived as a company through it and that you were able to, uh, to get 
you know, keep the supply chain going. What are you seeing uh, now in terms of supply chain? Supply chain, uh, is, uh, that's probably the that horse that we beat pretty hard in that period of time, but it, it still has a long ways to go. Uh, obviously, it's very, very difficult. It was very, very difficult in COVID, mainly uh, due to the container issue. Initially, that was you know, anything that was coming from overseas, which, you know, Tannis being a smaller company, we really did all we could do to uh, find local. Uh, and of course, this is going to, again, I've said that three times now. There's not anybody listening, Jeff, so they won't care. But we tend to try to <laughs> we tend to try to use Minnesota at that time, Minnesota vendors, uh, or else vendors we know in the U.S. and Canada. Uh, but once you went out state out, outside the country, it was so hard because the container stoppage. Well, then as you dug and peeled that onion onion back a little bit more, there was so much more to it. Uh, we have we have one particular component that wonderful cabin heater we talked to you about. Uh, that PTC element, that ceramic element, is made in one place in the world, and uh, that component is now a 60-week lead time, and that's six zero. So uh, managing to that and managing to other things that used to be four to six weeks, and we thought that was long, uh, has, has been uh, the supply chains and logistic people of all of our customers and of our companies. Uh, need to get a kudos given their way because you know, we're we're now seeing inventory levels rise so much more because when we can get product we buy twice as much which that again causes that much more of a problem in the supply chain issue. Uh, so uh, right now currently uh, we have one item that's 60 week lead time. Our harness wiring is 32 week lead times. So we're trying to be accurate and and predicting what we're gonna sell uh, year out and also meet our sales increase goals. One thing that has happened, uh, there's not been, there were you know, a, lot, a lot of losers in COVID. One of the winners has been general aviation per se in most of the segments uh, that have had a lot of increase, uh, but some of that we didn't predict. So even when we yeah. said, hey, this is what we're gonna use in 2022 or 2021, we were 30% ahead of that. And so, uh, you know, I, we see it, we see that it's getting better, but some components still are only single sourced, uh, yeah, as we talked about, there's several of them, but resins, resins are really a problem, especially high temp resins uh, and specialty wire is still, a high, it's still an issue. That, that makes sense. Um, a couple quick questions uh, just before we wrap up top of the hour, and that is, you know, is, is do you think preheating is is only something for cold temperatures, or is there something that you that is there a way that preheating can be applied to warmer temperature, higher corrosion environments to stave off corrosion by by being the surface that things don't condense on? Yeah. So uh, one, you know. You heard me state early on that you know, engine manufacturers mandate preheating at a certain temperature. We've done tests to prove that once that engine starts seeing anything below 50 degrees, there's a large benefit in preheating. 50 degrees affects a lot of people. Now let's take that segment a large, you know, to a larger, you know, 50 to 60, 60 to 70. We haven't done enough. Data, uh, statistical data analysis there yet to come to a conclusion. All the early things tell us that there's some, there's uh, quite a few benefits there. We're working uh, also looking at what are some of the other things that we can possibly do, uh, you know, other than finding that airplane up in the air most of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, yeah, we, we think there is, uh, in fact, that we, we pretty much know there is, but you know, again, we're a company that we want, to, we want to prove it out and we want to say, hey, we feel we would use it on everything that we're flying uh, before we go out and really hit it to the, to the general public. But uh, I think you'll see more of that. Uh, obviously, you heard that I, I sold the, the company back in 2021 to Harsel Aviation. Uh, we have had, we've got a lot of uh, companies that are part of that group. That gives us a lot of strength to uh, take things that are based here in the United States uh, and to try to say what what are some more things we can do uh, to make uh, flying that aircraft safer, uh, which is our, our tagline is uh, aviation safety starts 
pun intended, with uh, Tatus Aircraft. That's awesome. Well, Doug, I, I really appreciate it. And, and you know, uh, there's, there's, I think every picture I see of you is at the Alaskan Airmen's Gathering. <laughs> <laughs> You're you're highly publicized on the web with those folks. They 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 certainly care uh, care a great deal for the service that you provide and your products. Yeah, that's that is singing to the choir up there. Uh, we uh, we we have some dear dear friends there personally, even outside of the aviation industry. And then that's a bunch of aviation. Aviation is the life in Alaska. Yeah, and until absolutely. you've flown the state, you don't understand that when they say, "Well, take the road." Not a road or these roads. When you take the road, that's really it. There's there yep. is a road from Fairbanks north, and that that's the only choice. Other than yep. that, it's logging roads. So it is uh, uh, it is key. We're up there every year, and you know they raffle off an airplane too. So that that's pretty exciting. It's usually one that they're taking from scrap to uh, new again. And uh, you know it, it's uh, it, it is uh, singing to the choir because they know they have to preheat in order to operate. Uh, in fact, I talked to a customer today that said I got, I got six more loads of lumber that I got to get over on the lake because I'm on floats. He's on whip floats, so there's a plug to your sponsor tonight. Whip you know, air before before I before I lose the ability to land on the water. He said <laughs> I have to get six more loads of lumber up there, and they had 30 degrees yesterday. Wow. And uh, what's the best place for people who have questions, technical questions, product questions, everything else? How do they how do they reach you, Doug? Yeah, two ways. Uh, you know, the easiest, especially at night and such, is info at tanisaircraft.com. Uh, that's monitored by several people, and you'll be pretty amazed on our response time. Uh, then our telephone number is 952-224-4425, and then there'll be a menu to get a hold of the technical department. And we love talking about uh, what it is we do, but probably more importantly, it's learning and listening to our customers that take and make our product better each and every year. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time, for coming on Social Flight Live and helping to educate everybody on what they can do to get out there and do more flying this winter season wherever you live in the country. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jeff. All right. Thanks, Doug. Take care. And to all of you, thank you so much for taking time out of your evening to join us here on Social Flight Live. Next week, we are off because we'll be down at NBAA. If you happen to be down in Orlando for the show, track me down, and you never know, might have some Social Flight swag on me to be able to give you. We are back on... It's Tuesday, October 25th at 8 p.m. with Mike Bush. We're going to talk about how to not be stranded away from home, what to do if you get stranded away from home, all sorts of stuff um, for a really, really fun evening because it is always, always a fun time when Mike comes on the show. And then on Tuesday, November 1st, Caroline Jensen of the United States Air Force Thunderbirds will be here on the show, and that will be a lot of fun. She is an incredibly dynamic person, and I'm looking forward to having Caroline here. Until next time, thank you all so much again for joining us here on Social Flight Live, and I wish you all blue skies.